fundamentally, no doubt, right? Uh, having been through that period, I can, I can attest to just how, how, how strong that paradigm is, right? So, so I'm not talking about identity in a way that, that would lead one to kind of uh, understand better one's own story, one's own ethnic, religious, racial, sexuality, community, etc. All of that I think is hugely important. And that's, that's why I think the three key questions are, who am I? How do we relate to each other, and what can we do together? Right, and and the the term that we use for that, when you think about it at the national level, is pluralism. My my colleague Amber Hacker, uh, who's three days away from giving birth, by the way, right back there, she's looking at me. She's like, you have to talk about pluralism because that's what we do at IFYC. So our, our kind of three part definition of pluralism would be respect for identity, relationships between different communities, and a commitment to the common good which in a way is kind of the, the, the civic level of the three parts that you talked about. Wes? Hi. We had a speaker come. I wish I, I sounded like Greg Gersman. Came here and he said it was difficult for universities to talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict and big issues because they're afraid of losing money. How do you see this problem? So, I think I think the best way to engage the Arab-Israeli conflict at university campuses is for to talk about things that have to to talk about things deeply associated with Islam and Judaism that have nothing to do with the conflict. So, to begin, that doesn't mean avoiding the conflict, it just means that Muslims and Jews on this planet have a 1500 year history that spans dozens and dozens of countries that, that uh, uh, in which there's an intertwining of scientists and philosophers, an intertwining of legal scholars, an intertwining of worship practices, uh, an intertwining of, of civilization and literature, and the Arab-Israeli conflict, as ugly as it is, is 60 years in one part of the world. And I think that the most important thing that we can do for that conflict is to not extrapolate and universalize it to a 1,400-year relationship that's taking place across many continents. And I think what, what we can do is to say, we want to have an appreciative knowledge of other dimensions of Islam and Judaism and of the Muslim-Jewish relationship across the centuries and consider the Arab-Israeli conflict within that broader, largely positive cultural and civilizational context, you tend to come to that conflict with a different tone, so to speak. I'm going to give you one example of this. So when uh, Ferdinand and Isabella conquer Spain in 1492 and kick out the Jews, you know where they go? The Ottoman Empire. Because the Ottoman Empire, a Muslim empire, has a protected status for the Al Qadab, the people of the book. And what if you had uh, a speaker series on Jewish life during what some people call Geniza times, the Fatimid Empire, for example? Was it perfect? No. Was it the best place to be Jewish in the 10th century in the, probably the world? Yes. Right. So I think broadening the conversation instead of you know going like an angry linebacker after the pain point, broadening the conversation is a far more useful way of engaging it. And part of the reason is because I mean I wrote a piece for the, about this for the Washington Post during the Gaza War a couple of years ago. What 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 pro Palestinian or pro Arab and pro Israeli groups do when there's some kind of conflagration in the Middle East, is they dust off their press releases that they've had at the ready for 25 years, they change the dates and the names, and they send them out. In other words, we have the same conversation over and over and over again. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting to get to a different place. So it just seems to me we have to learn how to have a different conversation. And there's the beautiful thing is there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of wonderful things to talk about. I had a question. Um, you had mentioned when you were in Florida.
read about some of the radio stations and TV shows you were listening to. And I guess my question is, when you have, uh, well, in America, you have adult Christians forming a huge uh, part of the population, and you have many uh, adult Christians, and as well as as well as other sincere Muslims, or Hindus, or people of other faith, uh, as well as secularists or atheists and agnostics, which you know view interfaith dialogue rather negatively, um, and they, they either view it as threatening or they view it as well, what's the point? Right. And my my question is, especially for those that view it as threatening, yeah. How how do you engage that? Yeah. What a great question. I think Reverend Barnes back there is. Uh, I think he's kind of sharpened and focused in because he's about to launch the Interfaith Alliance here uh, uh, in Champaign County. And I sure hope, Reverend Barnes, that your, your new group is able to connect with what Masood and Greg and what others have done here on campus and, the, and what, um, what Ross has done as, as a staff person here with Interfaith in Action. So thank you for that question. So I would say the, the first thing to do is to clarify what is meant by interfaith cooperation and, and the, the Right now, if you were to ask a, a, the random educated person on the street what interfaith cooperation is, out of 10 people, I think four people would give you a blank stare, and the other six answers you get would be, would be different. They would each be different, right? Some people think interfaith cooperation is the acceptance of all religions. Some people think interfaith cooperation is the criticism of all religions towards some kind of enlightened secular humanism. Some people think interfaith cooperation is uh, a spiritual stance about everybody going to heaven. So I think the first thing, and, and, and you know, frankly, given all of these different, and in some ways, opposing definitions of interfaith cooperation, and I have stories to tell you about like, how somebody will say to me, oh, I'm so glad you're involved in interfaith work. We're finally going to win this thing in the Palestinian struggle. Or I'm so glad you're involved in interfaith work. Israel is going to spread to Judea and Samaria. And I'm like, you do realize that you're saying the exact opposite thing about the same term, right? Um, that's where we are in a way in the movement, which is that there's core disagreement about what the term means. So the only thing we can do at IFYC is to define what we think it means. And here's what we think it means. Interfaith cooperation is the positive engagement of religious diversity in a way that leads to better understanding and cooperation. So what is clear about that is that there is not a spiritual stance taken. This is not about us telling you that you have to believe all people are going to heaven. Okay. Um, there is not a political stance taken. This isn't pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli or anything along those lines. This is about positive civic relationships in the public square between communities who orient around religion differently, including secular humanists. And the more we clarify that, the more that we find that people across the spectrum are happy to work with us. Now, all of them, frankly, are left half full because Progressives want you to take political stances on their, for, on their issues, and conservatives want you to take political stances on their issues. And the hilarious thing to me is how many, how, like the kind of steam coming out of the ears self-righteousness that I encounter on a daily basis. Like, how can you say you want an interfaith organization and, and uh, allow secular humanists in, right? And somebody else will say, well, how can you say you want uh, an interfaith organization and not criticize religion in a way that leads to secular enlightenment. And we say, and, and so both of those people are left half full, and the pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli people are left half full, and the pro-God and anti-God people are left half full, which frankly is precisely why we are effective. Okay? I, want to, I want to say this very, very clearly. In a diverse democracy, People are going to have deep disagreements on a range of things. That is the definition of diversity. The definition of diversity is people who you have deep disagreements with. And if those same people cannot work together on other issues, then you don't have a democracy. And what we do at IFYC, and what we think interfaith work is about, is creating the space for people who have deep and fundamental differences in some of the most important issues of the time, from abortion to gay marriage to salvation, to come together and have positive relationships on other matters. Are we telling them that they have to give up their view on abortion? No. We're just telling them that their different views on abortion shouldn't mean that they can't have a positive conversation about building houses we have to have for humanity. 